design limits. But we don't very often talk about goods lifts. And the comment, goods lifts, who needs them, um, was actually generated by somebody in our own organisation at Curry Wharf who said, you don't really need goods lifts, all you need to do is manage the passenger lifts in a proper fashion and you can cope with all the goods. So he, he got a pretty short shrift answer, I think, out of that. But the, the idea was to try and look at this subject and perhaps raise it in terms of its profile and, and um, give it a little bit more prominence in the, the discussions that we have with, with designers and with architects and looking a little bit more in a pragmatic point of view, how they, they operate, what we need from them, and to look at perhaps a broader picture of where they fit within a, a, a much bigger um, area of building management and building logistics. So that's the purpose of what we're, we're looking at. So the purpose of the paper really is to look at the changes that are taking place in the way office buildings are used and the way in which they're operated. Look at the current guidance that we have, um, and there's only one place to look for that, and that's SIBSI Guide D, so we will look at the map. And then we're looking to see if we can establish a criteria and a methodology to actually define the number of goods lifts we need based on the criteria that we're trying to establish in terms of quantity and capacity of the lifts. So if we start with the first one and look at the buildings and how they're operated, um, there's been a lot of changes in the way buildings are operated and the way they work. Um, some of those have come about over time, some are more recent, but um, if we just have a look at those and some of the drivers that stand behind that. So perhaps the biggest significant thing we've seen recently is an increase in density levels in buildings. Um, and that's driven by the move from cellular to open plan offices. That's a key thing, and that's, again, not new. It's been going on for a while, but it's certainly something that um, is very conscious in the designer's uh, mind. Consolidation of business operations. We've seen businesses wanting to consolidate into one area and to come to one place where the, perhaps they've been dispersed before. So the need to have large office accommodation to, to accommodate that. <coughs> um, the other thing is needs for buildings to need to earn their keep. I think they're seen as expensive assets. They require a lot of maintenance. They require a great deal of attention. Um, they're not cheap items to build. So once you've built it, you've got to make sure you're getting some money back on your investment. So that's a key operating thing. Um, the business need for higher density office accommodation. We've seen this in, in places like trading floors. We're seeing it increasingly in other areas of the business, in banking, where it's not necessarily trading, but they're just trying to put an awful lot of people into a very small space because they want to maximise the amount of efficiency that they can drive from the building. Uh, marketing of high density buildings by letting agents. Big thing. Um, our building can accommodate a density of one to eight, one person per eight square metres. Um, we believe that gives us an advantage in terms of what we can offer our potential tenants. So the change in occupational densities has been a big impact. Um, one of the things that perhaps hasn't been quite so prominent but has certainly come to the fore in the last few years is the requirement of planners to include part of the building development within the public realm. So there's this idea that, that we've got this building, we want to develop it, but it's got to give something back to the community. And the way it gives something back to the community is providing access. And those access could be in things like the growth in rooftop um, public access restaurants. There's a number of buildings in London, particularly where you see you've got public access to rooftop restaurants, and that generates a flow of traffic to the top. It generates an awful lot of revenue for the people that operate the restaurants, that's for sure. And some of those operate 24-7. There's buildings in London where you've got people 24-7 able to go and dine in a very nice rooftop restaurant with fantastic views of, of the city. Um, the other thing is providing rooftop gardens and amenities is something that building developers like to offer tenants. So you've got this beautiful office building, but on the roof you've generally got a plant area. How can that be enhanced to provide a facility for the building users to access and have event space, breakout space? So there's a big increase in the requirement and also the desire to have rooftop accessible gardens. Um, and we know about high level public viewing galleries in tall buildings, very popular everywhere around the world I'd suggest where you need to have a facility to get people up there. But with all of those things, um, we talk about the access for the people, but we don't very often talk about the access for what supports that organisation, what supports the restaurants, what supports, how do you get the things there that you need to get there to provide the restaurants and the retail outlets. 
Um, the other thing that perhaps hasn't quite been realised, I think, but has come up on us is manual handling regula uh, regulations. Um, these are something that have been in, in being for a while, um, and they've generated this need to move things in a mechanical way to, e to effectively take it away from, from people lifting heavy loads. So the use of timber pallets for moving heavy goods and materials is something we're all probably all familiar, particularly during construction and fit-out works. Um, the use of wheeled cages, uh, you often see people walking around with those pushing them around, don't you? You see lots of that. And the use of wheelie bins. We call them wheelie bins in, in the UK and probably in Europe, they're a Euro bin. Um, they've got different descriptions, but basically wherever you go, there's a similar type of device, mostly used for, for waste removal. And the capacity is measured in litres. Uh, the Euro bins come from 240 to 1100 litres of, of, uh, of waste material. Building operations. One of the big drivers, segregated waste management. We now have segregated waste management where we didn't perhaps have that before. Again, it's something that's not particularly new, but it's, coming, it's becoming more defined. What that generally means is that you've got a waste management scheme that is not particularly high in volume because the waste is separated out, but you still need to put it into bins and you still need to distribute it. So in that process, you're generating a demand for goods lift services driven by the, the need to manage waste. Um, we've seen a decline in postal um, deliveries, but a huge increase in courier deliveries. And in courier deliveries, before it used to be somebody on the back of a motorbike with a package which they deliver, now it's a man turning up delivering a huge box. You can get deliveries of, of uh, courier provided um, materials that, that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And they come in vans, some of them come in small trucks, so it doesn't have to be somebody on the back of a, of a motorbike. Flexible delivery times. That's something else that's happened now. You can get your, your groceries delivered to your door up to 10 o'clock at night, probably, from 6 o'clock in the morning. And the same applies to buildings. So buildings need to adapt to this flexible means of delivery and the means of distribution to the, to the end users. Plant replacement strategy is a key thing. Um, I get the feeling it's more of a European thing than perhaps is used elsewhere, but it's something that's designed in from the very beginning. So the need to accommodate very heavy and very large items, generally the heaviest item isn't the largest item in the plant replacement strategy, but there needs to be a means of moving that plant around the building. And the goods lifts generally are the means of doing that. Refurbishment work and fit outs, um, obviously during construction, there's an element of that, but during the life of the building, there will be churn, there will be a need to refit the offices. So the ability to actually accommodate what's needed in the building is something that's needed of the goods lifts. So there's all these factors which are driving things. The other big one is the use of lifts during construction. Now I, I probably hazard a guess that although we look at what's needed in the end use, we never really consider um, how goods lifts are, lifts are used during construction and are they designed to accommodate the materials that they're going to be asked to move. Very often I think there's an end, an end design and then what happens is how can we make construction work around that. So we don't necessarily consider the equipment during the design of the, um, of the building itself in terms of what it's got to do. <coughs> use of jump lifts, um, for those who are not familiar it's the use of a permanent lift in a temporary condition in the shaft. They generally run at a faster speed, sometimes a little bit of a lighter capacity. But jump lifts as an aid to construction are something which are becoming more affordable and certainly more widely used, that's, that's for sure. Um, need to accommodate construction materials we were talking about and obviously then fit out materials, office catering and retail. Um, we we'll have to tell you about an experience we've had in one of our buildings where we, it was a residential building but there was a goods lift, an enhanced passenger lift, and it was designed for a 2.1 metre car and people have turned up with 2.8 long um, work surfaces in, uh, in, steel, uh, in stone. So granite worktops, 2.8 metres long, can't get them in the lift. <laughs> so something to think about. So what, sort of, what, what guidance do we have to provide us with some information? And if we look at guide D, uh, what we see is we, we've got effectively that says one dedicated could lift to be provided for up to 10,000 square metres. And then it says, for every additional uh, gross, and that, that's my inverted commas, 
20,000 metres, we should have another lift with a capacity of between 1,600 and 2,500 2 kilograms. And if you look at that guidance and take it to its extremes, you can see what happens. In itself, what does it mean? How do we utilise that information and, and what can we look at? Well, as lift people, we're pretty good at saying, OK, if we've got a floor area, the first thing we do is associate it with people. So how many people would that, in that first instance, the 10,000 square metres, be served by one lift? And if we think about the density rates, where perhaps in the day, going back a few years ago, we were looking at 1 to 14, we're now looking at 1 to 8. We can see some examples of this and the number of people that would be served by one lift. So if we take uh, a typical office building at 1 to 14, assuming a utilisation of 80%, just to confirm that utilisation factor is effectively, you've got a floor area, 20% of that floor area is not occupied because it's circulation space, it's tables, it's photocopiers, it's all those things that go with it. 80% of the space is populated at density that you're looking at. So if we're looking at a density of 1 to 14, we've got 700, uh, sorry, 571 people. If we look at a density of one, to, um, one person to eight, we've got 1,000 people. So one goods lift has a spread of over 400 and odd people, 430 people between the two. If we take the guidance from, from Sibsi to the extreme, and as a developer, we're pretty good at that, and saying what is the actual maximum we can achieve, what we could say is that if you add the 20,000 to the 10,000, forget the gross bit because that's gone by the by, we could end up with a building that's 29,999 square metres at an occupancy of um, 1 to 8 and, a, and an utilisation of 80, 3,000 people. So in theory, you could have one lift serving between 7, 570 and 3,000 people. So what does that really mean? What does that tell us? Well, one of the things we're great at as a species is generating waste. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? we? We always generate waste. So in office buildings, we're no different. We generate a huge amount of waste. So if we start to look at that and start to look at the guidance, there's BS uh, 5906 2005, Waste Management in Building Codes of Practice. And when you read through that and look at table one, it will tell you that in offices, 50 litres of waste per person per week. So that's the generation of waste. So now we've got something probably a little bit more tangible to, to deal with and look at. And if we, ex if we take that and we apply that to our maximum and minimum density levels, what we find is that 571 people will create 28,000. If we got at our maximum, we're at 150,000 litres of waste per week. So that all has to be moved in some fashion. And generally the means of moving that is in wheelie bins. So when you start looking at that, if we assume a euro bin capacity of 660 litres, which is a fairly common size, you can see the number of bin movements you need all taken through the goods lifts. So when you start looking at that, the number of bin movements is twice the number, because you've got to take them down and bring them back up again. There's also some washing facilities that are needed. And I can tell you in, in uh, One Canada Square, which is our own building, which is just over a million square feet, each night there's 250, almost 250 bin movements. That's getting bins down, bins back up, and bin washing. And that all starts at 7 o'clock at night and finishes at something like 3 o'clock in the morning. So that's a huge amount of movements, and you're relying on the goods lifts to actually provide that service and that facility. So it gives a little bit of a feel for where we are and what we're doing. Um, but goods lifts do provide other services. They provide beneficial use during construction, plant replacement, movement of hazardous materials. Um, hazardous materials in terms of movement like that can be things like glass, it can be high dust content materials, it can be waste, uh, sorry, water treatment chemicals. So all of those things get carried. They tend to have a risk assessment. They tend to come with a particular uh, facility for moving them. There's buns provided if there's, there's liquids involved and there's special procedures put in place. There's mitigation in case of spillages. Um, inward movement of goods, including food. So they come through the goods lifts. 
So if you've just taken up a load of dusty stuff, or you're going to take a load of goods, a load of food up. Um, waste removal, building fit out work and transportation of workers. So if you're doing building fit out works, then clearly you've got to get people up and down to accommodate that, and they generally travel in the goods lifts. Um, movement of post and couriers. We've spoken about courier deliveries are increasing, postal deliveries are declining. One of the things I didn't understand until fairly recently is that when you've got post movement, um, because post is post, it has to go on a dedicated trip. You can't take it with anything else. So there's contracts in place with, um, with the, uh, the tenants, so their, their post is delivered effectively uh, as a sole item and not as part of anything else. Um, and access for back of house staff. Lots of movement, cleaners, maintenance people all use the goods lifts to go up and down. So when you start to look at all of that and consider those things that, that we've talked about um, and start to see where we are, and if we're trying to establish a design capacity for the lifts, what are the key things that we should look at? So we're looking here about plant, plant I think the starting point is plant replacement requirements. So the need to move the heaviest and the largest item. I think we should be looking at construction use. So what are the things we're going to be using in construction? So certainly lengths of materials. One of the key, key things in there is uh, building fit out materials is floor to floor heights. In a lot of buildings you can get up to 3.3 meter high lengths of partitioning glass and if you're trying to put that in a lift that can't accommodate it you've got a, a significant problem. So that needs to be part of the consideration. Trees. Whoever thought you'd have a problem getting a tree up a building, huh? Yeah? So, but boy, can I tell you that that has been a problem. You get a four meter tree with a root ball that's a meter cubed, and someone's saying, can we get this up in the goods lift? And you say, well, not unless we cut a hole in the roof. Um, you've got a real problem on your hands. It's one of those things that, if you look at, at, at roof facilities, if you look at um, uh, atria, we, we tend to like to put plants in them. It's a very nice, it gives a very nice feel, ambient feeling for everybody. But when you've got to replace the trees, it's a bit of a problem, yeah? Unless you take them up there as saplings and then you let them grow for the next 10 years. So it is something you need to think about. Um, material handling, pallets, trolleys, urobins, stillages, those sort of things. How many goods lifts are designed to make the optimum use of bin loading, pallet loading? Just a question, yeah? So you need to think about that. Um, one of the things that's a big thing with me is about the use of the lifts by the emergency services. Now, how many office buildings could accommodate a stretcher in a, good, in a passenger lift? Yeah, and I think not many. I'm not talking here about evacuation, I'm just talking about day-to-day -day use of the lifts. If somebody did have an accident and had to be moved on a stretcher, probably the goods lift is the only way you're gonna get them down. You have gotta keep them flat. And we know stretchers today come with all sorts of facilities, they're quite big. Um, they can be quite long, so there's all sorts of life support facilities provided on stretchers these days. How many people think about that when they're designing goods lifts and thinking about goods lifts? A bit of a pet thing with me, but to me it's a consideration. Um, one of the things that is really good, I mean this is actually a, a chart courtesy of SWECO, but it's, it's providing information on domestic use. When it's looking at domestic items, um, refrigerators, washing machines, sofas, etc. And where, what, what, what size and capacity of lift they would, um, they would fit in. Now, I think we can take that and we can adapt something like that to start with for goods lifts. And instead of talking about refrigerators, we talk about building materials, we talk about pallets, we talk about euro bins, we talk about all the things that we want to put in there. But some sort of matrix like that would help, to, as, excuse me, as a starting point with the, um, with the provision of lift and lift design. Establishing a number. Now this is the more difficult part um, because I believe you've got to start looking at that and there's two possible solutions I can see at the moment. One is that we can develop a software simulation traffic uh, program that would take into consideration goods movement, would take into consideration the size of things that you're moving. And I think you could probably get to a point where you could get to a simulation software program that would provide you with some information on guidance and number of lifts that you need. The other one is you could take what we currently use, enhance it based on the current use and criteria we've been talking about, high density, public access, uh, waste streaming, 
and look to try to do that in terms of the number of lists based on area. So those are the two things I think which we can see will come and hopefully will develop. But the one thing I can tell you is that if you've got a public restaurant at the top of a building, it needs its own goods lift. And it needs to be a dedicated goods lift. Because we've had experiences now and I've seen it in the buildings we've been to and the building managers we've spoken to, everybody will tell you that a goods lift, will do well, a goods lift is, is uh, dominated by use to the restaurant. And it's just not about, sorry, it's just not about moving people up and down. It's about goods, it's about food, it's about laundry, it's about all of the bits of waste removal, spillages, smells, all those things come with goods lift serving restaurants. So if you've got a restaurant at the top of a building, it does definitely need its own lift. No question about that. So looking at a bit of a wider picture, what are the other areas we should look at? Well, there certainly needs to be correlation between loading bay capacity and management systems and the lifts. At the moment, there's a complete disconnect. People design loading bays in isolation, they design lifts in isolation. The two don't talk and the two are not necessarily married or are even compatible. So you can end up in a situation where you've got loading bays which are full of materials and you can't move them up or move them down. You can't get them in or out. Assessing the volume of goods arriving and the means of transport to the final destination. So I think you've got to try and get some understanding of the volume of things that are coming through, how they're coming through, how they're packed. Can you make an optimum use of the goods lifts in terms of facilitating that? I think we need to understand better as lift people, waste streaming, the impact that has on the means of moving goods up and down. We don't perhaps fully appreciate that. Um, and we need to have a coordinated approach to, ass to assessing building management logistics and the parts the goods lifts play. So building management logistics is, is the big picture. The lifts are part of that, which probably do not today figure in those discussions and those sort of uh, calculations. One of the things that we do need to look at is the means of moving goods in residential buildings. Um, there's a great desire to keep lifts to the smallest you can, but how does somebody get a, you know, a, a grand piano or a large wardrobe up in some of these blocks of flats? I don't quite know how they do that, but it does need to, to be considered. So, in conclusion, the comments are goods lifts are an integral part of a management, building, management of building logistics. So it's, it's the holistic view we need to take the list form part of that. The design should be seen as part of a coordinated approach encompassing the full scope of services required. And that's everything from moving building materials right the way through to uh, ref refurbishment and fit out uh, as the building life goes on. So in answer to the question, goods lifts, who needs them? I reckon it's just about everyone. Okay, thank you very much.